Welcome back to the lab. Welcome back to EE for everyone. It's time for a, a test that at least one of you probably won't be disappointed by. There might even be a few of you that were waiting for this, and I'm super excited. This is one of the first projects that I ever made. Well, that's not true, but it's one of the first custom circuit boards that I ever made, and I'll, I can poke it out here and show you a little bit, but unfortunately, it's kind of captured in here. Some guy way back when, I'm not going to name names, but, but some guy decided that it was a good idea to kind of hot glue everything in place and like cut slots in an enclosure and it's, it's kind of, it's not great. But hey, we've got a volume potentiometer, used a linear potentiometer for that fancy factor. Uh, which comes back into this channel. Got a mute switch up here. Um, so yeah, I, I think we can make this work for our testing. And at the end of the video, I need to basically cut every wire to get this thing out because I like, yeah. Anyways, let's not get into all that. But regardless of how the thing's constructed, the actual setup for this test should be pretty easy. We're basically testing one channel of this amplifier board. There's three channels on here. It's three um, off-the-shelf parts, separate circuits, same circuit duplicated three times. It takes two DC inputs. I need them to be isolated, because I'll admit I made this before I ever went to engineering school. So, uh, yeah, basically just took the reference design from the data sheet and... Uh, just went with it. I thought, hey, what's the worst thing that will happen? It might blow up. But turns out, not only did this design not blow up, despite my experience, it actually lasted. Used it all throughout college, had a kind of custom-ish uh, 7.1, 5.1 surround sound. All the speakers and stuff were basically car speakers, but now I'm just starting to ramble and tell you a story about my college years. So, yeah, basically that's what this is. This is an amplifier that I built because I've always been kind of fascinated with amplifiers. And uh, so, naturally, that was one of the first circuit boards I ever made. I've had these two power bricks. They're both 19-volt uh, bricks, so this thing's operating plus or minus 19 volts. And these need to be isolated power supplies from one another. So, yep, that's what those are. So I'm gonna plug them both into the same AC outlet splitter so they both power on at pretty much exactly the same time. So, got them in one of these jobbies. Uh, it's one way to make your two rails come on together. All right, there wasn't an explosion. Haven't powered this thing on for a long time, so that's not a guarantee. Also, so you can see my reflections, so that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I guess let's flip the switch. Hey, sure enough, mute switch still seems to work. <laughs> hey, all right then. Um, I think that's muted. All right. Let's put that somewhere where we won't accidentally short it out. Great. So on the scope, we can see the whole setup. We got one kilohertz coming in, nothing coming out. If we, I guess that's mute. Hey, there we go. Um, oh, I should probably turn on the fans, huh? I actually never really pushed this like this. It's always been sound. Um, let me see. Really don't want to kill the thing. Okay. Wow, that heat sink is already quite warm. Right on then. Uh, I think this thing has some built-in thermal protection. Whoo! That thing is very, very hot. Okay, let's turn that down. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> this heat sink is... It's made of copper... 
but holy cow did that get hot fast and the temperature is still climbing yikes all right we might need to let this thing cool down so if we get this thing up to about the level we did before let's see 16 what did we have editor go back and throw up the maximum that we got on a uh uh two ohm load wasn't 16 i think it was right around nine watts let's shoot for that let's shoot for nine watts yes yeah, right around five volts rms would be pretty close yeah uh we'll have to check somewhere around 4.8 4.9 yeah let's do that and yeah, there is some airflow here. Not enough, apparently. Still in contact with the heatsink. Let's try to get up to 4.9. Yep, so we're able to achieve a higher output power into a 2-ohm load. But I've got a feeling that output temperature... All right, we must have fallen off. Man, I wish I had an infinite heatsink. So yeah, that's um it's not ideal. Yeah, yeah, there we go. So, yeah, see that? That's the temperature this thing really is. 70 C. <laughs> Probably even hotter. Alright, let's uh let's crank up the fans for a moment. Sorry about the noise. Actually it seems like yeah, it seems not, not bad at all. So I guess it only annoys me and not you. So yeah, let's do it. Let's crank it up. So into a 2 ohm load, we can get more output power. The gain is higher. The output looks nice and clean. Yeah, they do. Yeah, so it's basically... Oh, interesting. Actually kind of a Darlington-ish output stage. Then they've got a current source, a couple BJTs, a uh, different, wow, uh, very different front end. They got a few current sources. Man, I'm going to put this uh, on the screen. That's actually a really cool uh, typical, or a, an equivalent schematic. It's actually really, really cool to see how they biased this thing to uh, make it happen. And it looks like it's made to have a bipolar supply, which is probably why we did that. Um, so that you don't need an output capacitor. So here we are, 100 hertz, one and a half volts out. Start increasing the frequency and look at how output amplitude changes. For your reference, I'm going to put cursors top and bottom like we did in our previous test. So there you go, there's the cursors. And I'll just keep cranking up the frequency. Gotta zoom again. All right, uh, gonna move up a decade. We're up to, what's that, 10 kilohertz? Still looks pretty great. Uh, looks like we're getting 10 kilohertz, so hey, look at that. Signal quality looks great. 20 kilohertz. Come on now. Don't, don't complain like that, multimeter. Uh, 20 kilohertz. Looks like we're still doing great. 30 kilohertz. Yep. Looks fine. 40, 50. We're at 100 kilohertz. Ooh, we're starting to see some weirdness there. Uh, so what is that, right around 40, right around 50 kilohertz, we're starting to see some distortion, visible distortion of that sine wave. You can see it right there. And it's getting more and more pronounced as we increase frequency further. Uh, we're up at 200 kilohertz now. But all things considered, and this thing's built for audio applications. As far as, like, what is required. Also, wow, yeah, that gain. There's some serious roll-off there. 
How did I not notice that right away? All right, everyone. I forgot to hit record. So let's try to do this teardown again. We're going to do a faithful reenactment. All right, so this enclosure here is built up with a bent sheet of acrylic. We have a back panel layout that I think was actually drafted in PCB design software, and then I drilled it out on a drill press to get the layout of input, output, input, output, input, output, two power inputs and the power switch on the back. That's about all she wrote. This is like a remote mute interface. I had a kind of this jerry-rigged thing with like, five or sorry i think it was three amplifiers and like an eq and basically turning one on turn them all on so that's like a remote start for this uh thing got a piece of light diffuser to serve as the bottom panel and this is the circuit board uh yeah so I don't remember if I said this, so I'll try saying it again. You know, the thing that really gets me about and the thought of off-the-shelf versus full custom like we did, it's like the circuit that we made, yes, it seems to work when we built one of them, and I really do love this amplifier. I love this circuit board that we made. I'm super happy with it. Playing audio through it just made me giggle, and I mean, hey, there's something to that pushed some power through it. It's awesome. I love this thing. I love it. But compared to something like this I see, this off-the-shelf part, this LM3886T, right? When you look at the data sheet, you can see the internal like structure of the thing. It's got a bunch of current sources. It's pretty complex. It's got some safe operating area protections and all kinds of fun stuff like that. We saw it cutting out when we pushed this thing beyond its limits. And our design just won't do that. Our design will just break when you push it beyond its limits. <laughs> That's not ideal. That's not good. So like if you're really building an amplifier, if you really need an audio amplifier, I can't possibly recommend that you design it from scratch and do it up with discrete parts, but as a design exercise, as a thought experiment, as something to play around with analog hardware and analog design, I mean, yeah, it was a lot of fun, and I think you should, but... So I just want to walk through kind of what we did as long as we've got this board out and we're, we're looking at it. I mean, just look at the thing. That's beautiful. All through hole, single-sided board. I drilled all these holes by hand, and basically what we did to, to build this thing... I'll zoom in a touch. Is we took a copper clad board, just a flat sheet of copper, and took the toner transfer method. So basically that is where you print onto a piece of like a water soluble backer, iron that on, dissolve it away, and then you have this etch resist that's made of the plastic powder that comes from toner, like from a laser printer. Go ahead and dunk that in an acid bath, take it out, drill a bunch of holes. And then what I did is I took like a Q-tip or something. And you can see where I painted on that uh, solder mask equivalent, which is, um, what was it? It was, uh, uh, I think polyurethane is what we used, probably. Almost certainly polyurethane. Let that dry, solder in your components, and boom, there it goes. We got a couple pin one indicators, and that's really about all there is to it. I etched this myself, and yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, I just put my name on it, Rev2, 2013, labeled all the inputs and outputs, and yeah, I, I love this board. It served me well for seven or eight years. Wait, is that right? Wait, 2013 plus seven, 20. Wow. Yeah, seven or eight years. It's funny how time flies. I can remember building this thing like it was yesterday, but unfortunately, we don't have time travel for me to go back and show you the process. But I assure you, I was just as excited about this as I was when we were testing our board together. Gotta say that 60 watt limit there, that's uh, a little ambitious given that we saw this thing cycling on and off when we had... 10 watts coming through it due to the thermal limit, but hey, it did what I needed to, 
And I actually actively used this thing as an audio amplifier for quite a while. I think I was actively using this thing for three or four years. Well, I suppose that's about all I got for you. Um, this has been a really fun series. I've really enjoyed talking about this amplifier that we built and designed way back when. And I really enjoyed building our modern, more advanced, well, more complicated, not necessarily more advanced, <laughs> discrete version to compare against. Both have great signal quality for the audio range. So I hope that you enjoyed this series. I hope that you enjoyed this video. And I hope that you learned something great today. Um, yeah. A potential feature like mini series add-on, same idea, might be if we do a discrete Class D amplifier, but not really sure if or when that might be coming down the pipe. It's not really planned, just a sparkle in my eye at the moment. But leave a comment down below if you've got some thoughts about that or really anything. And special shout out to our Patreon members. Thank you for supporting EE for Everyone directly. It really helps a lot to keep this whole thing going, and I appreciate you. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. So thanks for watching EE for Everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye!